Hey, what's up, everybody? We have a new YouTube channel. Make sure you subscribe right now. Leave a comment on the video. Share it with your friends. It's also a podcast. Three and out. Wherever you listen with me, John Middlecoff, Apple, Spotify, we have you covered. As well as thevolume.com. We have merch. Check out. I got three and out hats right now. Thevolume.com. Search the podcast. Buy some merch. What is going on, everybody? Pro days, pro days, and more pro days. We had uh, the LSU, which was a zoo, on Wednesday. Got my days mixed up. I want to dive into that because, uh, obviously, we talk a lot about the quarterbacks. Jaden worked out today. Penix and Drake May both had workouts at Washington and North Carolina. Pretty sweet. I saw a highlight of a Drake May throw, and it's North Carolina, and then the Jordan logo in like a light up capacity. It's pretty, pretty badass in the indoor facility. Couple thoughts in regards to just everything that's going on there. And uh some 49er topics I want to hit. I saw a lot of people because Jed York talked this week and he mentioned about paying Brock Purdy and paying the quarterback a lot of money. A lot of people have had some thoughts. And uh Eric Armstead, who also has a podcast, uh gave some comments about his release and everything that went down in terms of the 49ers and what led that now is the reason he's on the Jacksonville Jaguars. And uh, a report about Sala and Woody Johnson yelling at each other or arguing uh, in public. Got a little too much action there. in uh, At the owners' meetings. And uh, Woody Johnson says it's BS. So, obviously, it's always something with the Jets as well as a couple other NFL things and and Fugazi Friday because it's Friday. So before we dive in, I mean, there's a lot of good football stuff. There there, there really is. And we got, we got a big guest next week. Um, You don't hear him often. He's uh, been underneath. I wouldn't say hiding under a rock, but he's an interesting guy that used to be in the forefront of all of our lives that are around football for a long time. So I'm, I'm excited to talk to him. So keep an eye out for that bad boy. But before we dive into some football. You guys know the drill. My friends, at game time, Sweet 16 tonight. Do you live in New York City? Uh, do you want to go to one of these games? Do you live wherever these venues are going on? Do you want to go to any event? College, pro, comedy shows, concerts. We got you covered. Just download Game Time, the official ticketing app of this podcast. And when you download the Game Time app, here's what I need you to do. Promo code John, J-O-H-N, J-O-H-N. $20 off, $20 off your first pair of tickets. I've gone to a ton of events. I didn't even realize, man, Fred, he's not exactly Mr. Marketing. Opening day. I like baseball. On, I swear to God, if you would have told me opening days next week, Saturday, Thursday, I, I had no clue. And then I turned on social media and it's just guys hitting home runs, guys striking out. I was like, hey, you want to go to a baseball game? Um, do it on us. Download the Game Time app, promo code John, save $20. Pro days. I've always been a believer in do what you're good at. What The advice I always give to any young person asking here is like follow your passion because you're usually going to be better at your passion. You're going to put more time into it. Now, some of us are just more natural at stuff, right? Like Emerald Lagasse no matter how much time I spend in a kitchen, I'm never going to be able to, you know, prepare a better dish than him, right? It's just not going to be possible. Some people are better at negotiating deals than others. Obviously, not all of us have the intellectual capacity to be a doctor or, or a lawyer, but I'm a huge believer when you figure out what you do well, quadruple down on that thing as you get older, professionally. And I, I never understand why people... At pro days, even high-level prospects don't work out. Like, if you're a good athlete, you should want to work out. It's a time to shine, right? It's a time to impress people. If me or you worked out, obviously it wouldn't look great. We're not great athletes. No one wants to see us run and jump. But if I was a high-level college player, and my team had a pro day, even if I was a consensus top 10, top 15 pick, why wouldn't I want to run and jump? Things I do well. Now, I understand Marvin Harrison, his dad, 
which I've been told is like all this stuff stupid. And he's not totally wrong. This is not going to dictate one way or the other. You go in six or you go in 30th. But like Marvin Harrison, who's dominated college football for the last couple of years, getting open on everyone, wouldn't he want to display his physical characteristics in front of the decision makers? What's the most important thing for any sales guy? Don't waste time with people that can't make decisions. You always want to get in front of the decision maker. I've been an area scout. I've gone through these schools. I was never the decision maker. I can give my opinion on stuff, but you wanted to get in front of Howie Roseman, Andy Reid, right? Well, I'm watching these pro days the last couple of days with the quarterbacks, Jaden, Drake May, Penix. And it was like this with Caleb and all these GMs and all these coaches are in attendance. Well, in a draft room, who's the person that says thumbs up or thumbs down on a pick? It's not the scouts. It's not the college directors. It's those guys. And Malik Neighbors yesterday, and I, I heard some scuttlebutt around LSU that he was like, okay, you know, you want to see who the number one wide receiver is? Watch this, fellas. He went out and he ran a 4-3-5, and he jumped like 42 inches. Malik Neighbors, a lot like Marvin Harrison, did not need to do anything. Was not necessary. His film is dominant. And let's face it, in a much better defensive conference in terms of NFL athletes at defensive back than the Big Ten. And again, I'm not trying to act like this is the end-all, be-all. But one guy who is widely viewed by many teams as the best wide receiver prospect said, fuck it, you want to watch me run a 4-3-5? Take my shirt off, have at it, boys. Get those clocks out. Where's the vertical setup? I plan on jumping out the gym. And I, I just don't understand. Like, I, I give credit to these quarterbacks, right? Caleb did not need to work out, but he did. Why? Because he throws the football well. Why would you not want to work out? It'd be like if someone asked me, hey, John, uh, we're interested in hosting a show with you and Bill Belichick during the season. Every Sunday or every Monday before Monday night football. Like, wait, I just talk football with Bill Belichick? Good at good at talking, no football. I'm in. I I wouldn't even hesitate. Now, if you had, hey, do you want to open for uh Dave Chappelle on uh improv night on Wednesday? I'd be like, yeah, it's probably not a great idea. If you wanted Marvin Harrison to do something he wasn't comfortable doing, I I'd get it. Like, this is stupid. This doesn't make any sense. Wait, you just want me to run and run routes and catch the ball in front of guys? It's literally my greatest attribute currently in life in terms of professionally. Like, this is what I do at an elite level. I, I don't understand guys that push back, and I don't think it's a great idea. And listen, I don't know ultimately which guy is going to go ahead of others, but Malik Neighbors put on a show, and most people would tell you there is not some clear one and two. If anything, these two guys are neck and neck, and a lot of teams, from what I've heard, might have neighbors above them. And he didn't hesitate to work out. Rightfully so. He's fast. He's a freak athlete. Why would you not? When you think about the great wide receivers over the years, they love working out. Why? It's like when, uh, when, when college teams, high school teams, the pro teams, when you do the conditioning tests, do you know who dreads those? The fat guys. Why? Because it's difficult. It's hard to run conditioning tests when you're a 310-pound offensive guard or defensive tackle. That's a challenge. You know who didn't? The wide receivers and the DBs. Why? Because they're way more athletic, and even if they're out of shape, they can still handle 99.9% .9 of athletic testing stuff. So I think it was a mistake, and I, I applaud neighbors for just doing what he's good at, running and jumping. That's literally going to be his job. We know all these guys can catch the football. So, listen, when Neighbors goes above Marvin Harrison, if that's the way it plays out, is it because of this pro day? No, it's not. But if you don't think putting on a show in front of all the decision makers that are drafting from 4 to 12 matters, you'd be pretty naive. You really would. These guys didn't just fly there to fucking have the gumbo, right? They, they, they flew there to watch these guys.
And it's when you do something positive, that can only help. And when you're a great athlete, doing these pretty remedial things relative to what you do on a football field should be a no-brainer. And, like, listen, when I watch these quarterback workouts, and I watched a little bit last night, I was, we had dinner cleaned up. She, she was like taking a bath. I'm like, yeah, oh, the pro day replay. So I watched a little, kind of boring. Like, you're not getting the quarterback, whatever. Honestly, even with the wide receiver, I know all these guys can run rounds. I am pretty impressed when a guy runs a 4 3 5. Like, yeah, I knew he was fast. He's really fast, right? I knew he was an explosive guy. He's really explosive. He's what we say in the business a freak show. And th- that that was impressive. But when you watch these quarterbacks roll out, underthrow, overthrow, complete pass, I, I don't care. I mean, <laughs> none of this is real football. When you play a football game at quarterback, you have four or five guys chasing you and other guys being covered. So when you're just playing pitch and catch, you're not getting anything out of that. Like that, you stand much more on the tape when it comes to the quarterbacks. Now, one thing I saw that was really impressive I'm not going to lie, and I'm biased. Like, I I tend to root for West Coast people. And I know Michael Penix isn't technically from the West Coast, but he became a star at the University of Washington. And I'm a sap for the Pac-12, even though it no longer exists. I think a lot of people comp Penix, and I kind of did too, to like a Tua, right? He's really a pocket passer, and and the Tua one's easy because they're both left-handed. Throws a beautiful deep ball, but he's not Mr. Scramble guy. And that's never how he's played. Now, part of it was at Washington. They had, a lot like Michigan, an elite offensive line. So he wasn't getting touched that much. He had a lot of time in the pocket, and he picked you apart. But I think when that happens, and I know it did with Tua, you're like, well, Tua's not a very good athlete. Tua can't scramble, really, if he wants to. I mean, he can move, but he's not by any means a runner. And he is not a guy that is going to be potent on the ground. He didn't run a 40 coming out because he was injured with the hip. But I think we all agreed, like, Tua's not super fast. It's not really his game. Now, it never was Michael Penix's game these last couple years at Washington. Uh, I know some people said before he got injured, he was much more of a dual-threat quarterback when he was really, really young at Indiana. Uh, I'd be lying if I said I knew who he was at the time. But obviously, these last couple years, off the different injuries he's had, he's just a pocket passer. And then today he goes out, and I know NFL Network, I think, tweeted and Instagrammed out that he ran a 4.55 or some or a 4.45. I talked to a sc- couple scouts that were there that got him like 4.53, 4.54, which is an excellent time. Like, that was a very, very impressive time for Michael Penix. Like, he can run. I mean, that's that much is pretty clear. And he also jumped 36 and a half inches. Michael Penix is a really good athlete. So he is viewed because of his play style as a pocket quarterback. And that's all you can go off of. The way he played in college, pocket quarterback. Caleb, dual threat. Jaden Daniels, definitely dual threat. Even Drake May, scrambled a lot more. You watch Michael Penix, you go, that's a pocket quarterback. And then you see this, you're like, well, he actually can move a lot. Now, that doesn't mean there aren't questions with him. The injuries, uh, the way he played against Michigan, which was basically an NFL team. It was hard for him. It rattled him. Uh, I'm inclined to, I mean, I'm definitely rooting for him. I wouldn't just bet my career on drafting him. But when you have the film that he does over a couple year span, and then you have the athletic testing, I know I've talked to buddies that have him in the second round. I think this guy's going to end up going in the top 20. When you factor in the position he plays, when you factor in his super high character guy, when you factor in how beautiful his deep ball is, and let's face it, these teams are desperate. And one thing we've learned over the years, is quarterbacks get overdrafted. I mean, Kenny Pickett and Mac Jones, to me, historically, with their physical attributes, are like third or fourth round picks. Kirk Cousins, fourth round pick. The hell's the difference between him in college, Mac Jones, and Kenny Pickett? Well, the inflation in recent memory has driven guys up. It's part of the deal, right? You you, you want a house right now, you can go on Zillow all you want and go, God, they, they paid 400 grand for this house in 2017. No one cares. It's 2024, and that house is now listed for 1.1. So if you want it, you better be in that vicinity or don't even waste your time. And I think that's the the reality with Michael Penix. We can nitpick him apart, and that's the right thing to do. That's part of the process. But he's he's going to go higher than any of these people that are down on the guy. I, I promise you that. And other than that, like, 
you know, Jaden Daniels, all, all you, you turn on, you know, you see day ball, you see all these guys there, Antonio Pierce, Sean Payton sending contingents. It, it's pretty clear where all these quarterbacks are going. I think it would be very, very shocking for, I don't know exactly who's going to go where, but I think we got a pretty good idea who's going to end up with a quarterback by the end of halfway through the draft, right? Obviously the first three teams are going to have quarterbacks. Minnesota going to have a quarterback. The Giants, a little bit of a wild card because if you're day ball, like there's some pressure on you to win. So do you want one of these wide receivers? Denver, the Raiders. Like, I don't think there are going to be some big shockers coming when it comes to all this. The thrill and excitement of March Mania is here. And DraftKings Sportsbook, one of America's top rated sportsbook apps, is giving new customers a shot to turn five bucks into $150 instantly in bonus bets with any college basketball bet. North Carolina listeners, don't forget DraftKings Sportsbook is now live in your state. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app and use code JOHN, J-O-H-N. New customers can bet five bucks to get $150 instantly in bonus bets only at DraftKings Sportsbook with code JOHN. The crown is yours. Speaking of quarterbacks, Jed York, you know, all these owners at the owners' meetings, I don't know if they're actually obligated to talk to the press, but most of them do a scrum with their local reporters. It's like kind of throwing them a bone. And Jed, who does not talk much, maybe twice a year, like most owners, most owners avoid giving any statements because in fairness, no matter what they say, becomes very polarizing, becomes a headline, and gets twisted as we go. Every comment they have. Hell, Robert Kraft was like, yeah, what was up with that documentary? It's like, Robert, you fucking produced the thing, <laughs> right? John Mars like, they, they can draft a quarterback if they want. And then everyone's like, well, are you guys drafting a quarterback? Your owner wants you to draft a quarterback. So it's, I, I, I get why they just, just let the coach and the GM do all the talking when it comes to football. We'll talk about the business, the stadium and stuff. But for the most part, I want to avoid some of these guys, you get them talking, though, they're no different than me and you. They got opinions. They got thoughts. I mean, this is this is not just their passion. This is their life, right? This is what makes them famous. So Jed's asked about the quarterback situation, and he basically said, like, obviously, when your quarterback is the highest paid guy on your team, that's usually a good thing. Alluding to they're going to pay Brock Purdy a lot of money, potentially, at the end of next year. And my entire take on contracts in general is why we're always in such a big rush to pay people. Like, I under, Patrick Mahomes, after year three, he'd won an MVP. He was clearly a superstar. He had been to an AFC championship. He had won the Super Bowl. You just watched him. You're like, this is a second coming, like Brett Favre mixed with Aaron Rodgers. And then a lot of players are not Justin Jefferson, are, are not Trent Williams, are not Aaron Donald. Like, God, I've never seen anything. Most guys, even the good ones, are like, oh, let's see you do it again. And I, I the moment the Super Bowl happened, or really this, as the Super Bowl run happened with the 49ers, no matter what happened with Purdy, he could have thrown 50 touchdowns, you know, in December in the playoffs and the Niners win the Super Bowl and they blew everyone out. He still would have been a polarizing player next year. Because they're be like, well, can he do it again? What's he actually worth? And if he had flopped, right, if they had lost that game against the Packers or lost that game against the Lions, everyone would have crushed him. But it was all going to be determined in 2024. What does he look like this year? Does he have another season where he's clearly one of the best NFC quarterbacks? Because if he has two and a half seasons of playing like one of the better NFC quarterbacks, the reality is his value is not really arguable. Now, I would say like I would struggle and I get the cap keeps going up. Like I'm not very comfortable unless he's my homegrown all pro guard given free agent guard 17, 18 million dollars. Because I don't think the margin for error is very big there. I'm signing this guy just because he's a free agent. I'm giving him a 30 or 40 percent markup. And then if he is just an average or above average guy, we're at a disadvantage. He better be a top four or five player at his position or I'm misallocating funds. It's no different than that with quarterbacks. Like, listen, I like Dak Prescott. He's a very good quarterback. But once you start paying him premiums, like it's a lot of pressure on. Him. And listen, Dak has been very successful during the regular season. He just hasn't gotten it done in the playoffs. He's going to have, you know, when you look back at his career, it's going to be defined if he's ever able to get over the hump he's going to be very rich, have a ton of pro bowls and, and been a very, very good starting quarterback for the Cowboys. I think the hard part with Purdy, a little like Dak early on, was like he gets to inherit this great team. 
Now, I've said forever, if you if you watch the 49ers and you can't watch and say, this guy's really good, then I, we, we don't have anything in common with football. But there's a difference between, like, I watch the guy, he's really good. It's like, are you comfortable giving him $200 million guaranteed? Because that's a whole other conversation. And a lot of people have talked, Purdy's best attribute has not been his contract. It's been his play. He's been excellent. But obviously, the ability to have a $850,000 quarterback, you know, it, it is a huge curveball for your organization to build out. Like, no one else in the league has that right now. Even the other top young quarterbacks make a decent amount of money. C.J. Stroud was the second pick in the draft. Sounds like a $35 million contract. And his yearly numbers are like eight and a half, nine, seven, like in that range, right? Purdy is, even if C.J. Stroud, I don't, I haven't have his contract up, is making $8 million next year in his second season, Purdy is eight or $7 million cheaper. Like that's a player or two. And I just think we're too quick to rush. Let's just see it play out. And if this year doesn't go as well, and he kind of takes a step back, then we got another year under contract. If he goes out and he wins the MVP and the 49ers finally win the Super Bowl, then yeah, you, you don't have a choice. But sometimes when you just let like one year, and that's basically what this is. Now, I know he was good that first year, but like this year, start to finish, and this year is going to be different, right? Because there was a feeling out process. Everyone's gunning for the Niners. They're the NFC champs. Uh, no one is taking Purdy lightly. And listen, I've been saying this forever. The media is, like thinks Purdy's very average. Andy Reid thinks he's good. Steve Spagnuolo thinks he's good. I saw. I watched Dan Campbell's press conference at the owners' meetings. He thinks he's damn good. So the, the league thinks he's really good. I think he's good. But before we pay large sums of money, and there's a difference. Like, would I pay him right now four years, a hundred million? Yeah, wouldn't hesitate. Would I give him four years, one hundred eighty million dollars? Yeah, we're talking something different then. So I, the money matters. Like, th this is a business. Speaking of business, Eric Armstead was not pleased with the way he was disrespected, according to himself, with the way everything played out with the 49ers. And this is the hard part about the sport. Eric Armstead, team captain, team leader, high-end player. But when, you, when your salary doesn't equal your production slash games played, and you're an older player, we got a problem. Like, that was the issue. The reason they, quote-unquote, disrespected you, and it's not your fault, no one wants to get hurt, but when you're not available, and I'm paying you a premium, 16, 17, 18 million dollars, it no longer adds up. So, reports, I think based on him, said that they basically offered, you know, he's scheduled to make almost 18 million dollars. They wanted him to make six, with incentives to get up to like eight or nine. So, basically taking a haircut in half. Like, I'm on Team Niners here. Like, that's the right move. And listen, you probably know he's going to say, yeah, not that interested. But that's part of being a healthy organization is when you get a guy, even when you love them, of like, this is not adding up anymore. And I know the Jags offered him a lot of money and, and he got paid. But th there's there's a fine line. We're all human beings. And anytime you deal with anyone's money, whether you make 80 grand or whether you make $8 million, when you start talking pay cuts, we're all the narrator of our own story. It's going to piss us off. Even if we've underachieved, even if we haven't been available, no matter what. It's, I, I don't blame anyone for being offended when uh, the, your company comes to you and wants you to take less. Sometimes it's valid, though. Like, sometimes it makes sense. Like, you're not worth this price point anymore to us. It doesn't mean to someone else's situation, but to us, we can't pay you this. And I think the 49ers, which clearly was very hard on them, made the right decision. There was a story that Colleen Wolf, who works for the NFL Network, which, as Mike Florio has pointed out, is owned by the 32 teams. This is not some independent organization that is just saying things to say things. This is the Owners, like, call the shots when it comes to that organization. It's why if you're watching NFL Network, it's not going to be the most aggressive uh, production when it comes to being critical of stuff. Players, yeah, but in terms of owners and operational stuff with the league, that's not going to be their style. So when it was reported 
on a NFL media podcast that Robert Sala and Woody Johnson had an altercation. I saw that line. I was like, damn, screaming at each other. Now, Woody Johnson comes out and says, unequivocally not true, disregard, fake news. I wasn't there. I don't know what to believe. But one thing that can't be argued, the Jets are kind of always a shit show. Right? If this had happened between like, hey, Dan, uh, let's use let's use this as an example. Dan Campbell and Brad Quinn were kind of yelling at each other. And then both of them were like, that never happened. It's like pretty clear they have a really good working relationship. Always been hunky dory whenever we've seen them together these last couple of years. You'd be like, yes, that's kind of a weird report. That's probably not true. But if something happens with the Cowboys, you're like, yeah, hey, Jerry and Mike, something's off. Kind of believable, right? Like, I'm sorry. One thing I've heard about Woody Johnson, not the easiest guy to work for. And I think it's pretty reflective in the organization's success over the last decade and a half. So did this happen? I don't know. Honestly, I don't really care. It, it does not matter. People argue all the time. Professionally, personally, welcome to the real world. I mean, Woody Johnson just said the other day that if we can't trade Zach Wilson, he's going to be on the team. It's like, the owner, what are you talking about? Just And, and I understand why. He doesn't want to cut him and eat that whatever it is, $7, 8000000 million that you'd have to pay him. He wants no part of that, which I understand from just a, a dollars standpoint. Doesn't make sense. But from a football standpoint, you no longer can have the guy around. Like, it's over. He has no trade value. No one is trading anything for him unless either you eat the majority of the money and the only way he's on another team, which I would guess is everyone's hoping that you cut him. So obviously Woody's trying to like draw a line in the sand. But the story's believable. Why? Because it's the Jets. And sometimes when things come out about, right, certain players, you go, yeah, I can see that. You just see crazy stories sometimes about like Tyree Kill. You're like, yeah, I don't know. Might be true. But then you see a story about certain guys like Patrick Mahomes or Josh Allen. You're like, yeah, seems a little out of character. Sometimes perception is reality. Let's be real. A lot of times it is. And the Jets, they got a lot of weird shit going on. Uh, a lot of owners, that NFLPA report card that came out, they gave a lot of them Fs about like their training room, their locker room, their cafeteria. We're not happy. Uh, I, I think I saw... Who was the owner? One owner said, I, I didn't write it down, that thought it was just uh, like a media skeptical. Like this isn't a constructive back and forth where you meet with the NFLPA and they go, hey, we got these negative marks for you. What's your opinion or how can you go about fixing it? It just gets released and then we all talk about it. And there were a lot of F minuses going around. I think I saw Josh Harris who, in fairness, took over the team from Dan Snyder. I don't put any of this on him. Said he didn't even know an F- minus was possible. Uh, but that's what happens when you take over Washington. I do think here's the problem. And in my experience, I've only worked for one team. It was top-notch. Jeffrey Lurie spends every dollar when it comes to improving anything, whether it's the draft room, whether it's training room, whether it's any facility. He'll, he'll cut a check. He's very pro, money, do what we got to do. But this isn't college football. So a lot of these guys, if you're coming from LSU, if you're coming from Alabama, if you're coming from Georgia, if you're coming from Ohio State, if you're coming from Oregon, it's the Taj Mahal because they had to use that to recruit you. The recruiting in the NFL is like, it's your game check. <laughs> it's, hey, I pay you $10 million a year, right? S sorry, our cafeteria isn't a little bigger. Now, it is bad business, if you have a shitty weight room or your cafeteria doesn't have good food, like that, that's on you, right? Even Bidwell, I judge him for charging the containers for guys to take home. Like, what are you doing? But if you like, don't like the chairs or if your locker room isn't glamorous enough, like that's not this industry. <laughs> this industry, it's completely different. And I would imagine for a lot of younger players who are now playing in power five at all these big time programs, they have spent hundreds of millions of dollars on the aesthetic of it all, right? But it's not like you need these flashing lights and seven lockers per guy with an Xbox and a TV screen in it. Probably not. And I would imagine a lot of NFL teams are like, this is kind of stupid. We're not going to do that. And there's a fine line. Like if you're putting yourself at a competitive advantage, 
training wise, lifting wise, eating wise, then you're bad at business. Like you're a fucking moron, you're cheapskate. But if you're doing, if it's not hindering any player's ability to get better, to get the proper nutrition, to train, then I, I wonder if some of this stuff's a little overrated. And last but not least, before we dive into Fugazi Friday, is the NFL is going to auction off the Christmas games because it wasn't technically on the schedule, I think, of the media buy. And Pro Football Talk said that potentially like $50 million a game. So it's just an extra $300 million. So not only did they steal the real estate and the land from the NBA and basically render them irrelevant on that given day, they're profiting from it immediately. And let's face it, these networks are going to line up to pay that. Well, if you have people lined up and bidding, who's to say they can't get $75 million for each game and get $150 million of something that they just invented from nowhere that wasn't going to exist before? Free revenue. And this is what I, I think when Cuban said pigs get fed, hogs get slaughtered when he talks shit, I do think there was an element of jealousy. And when you're on top, everything you do, you're able to monetize and you're able to make more money when you're popular, right? And I think it pisses a lot of people off. The media, obviously, always, they hate it. They, I mean, let's face it, they, they hate a lot of successful people when it comes to business. I don't know if they were like taught that as a kid. I don't know if they learned that in Big J Journalism School. But their general take on any successful stuff when it comes to business is always like, oh, the corrupt, corrupt capitalism. It's like, yeah, welcome to the real world. And the NFL has figured out a way to capitalize on this better than anyone. And I don't know if it's going to last forever, but in the, in the immediate future, all you can say is cha-ching. Okay, Fugazi Friday. I had someone, he was a restaurant owner, who was like, you know, I, I come to podcasts for positive encourage, encouragement and uplifting and all you guys on Fugazi Friday, it's such a negative complaint session. Turns out he was a business owner and he was mad about the tipping thing. It's like one thing, another guy's like, stop talking about tipping. It's like, guys, Fugazi Friday's not going anywhere. I'm going to try to pick some other Fugazi Fridays that aren't tipping related. I also think for the most part, universally, everyone that interacted with this was not saying like, I'm not going to tip if it's good service. But the the notion that you just have to tip without good service, that's what everyone was talking about. I, I think we've all been on the same page there. But I, I, I took some screenshots of some other ones. Fugazi Friday. The unsubscribe button process for spam emails has to be up there with the fakest thing ever. It doesn't help matter how many times you do it. Those emails are still coming. And starting a new email address to avoid the spam is harder than it sounds with all the legitimate contacts and businesses who rely on reaching you through that email. That's a great point because I have several times, like a lot of people, hit that little unsubscribe and you just, you can't keep track of every spam email you get. And then you realize like I unsubscribe from, you know, restoration hardware or Nike Golf, or Dell Computers. It's like, they're just relentless. Now, uh, the I would say the good thing with email is I think we're so numb to just kind of moving through it. But like most people now, our businesses are pretty interconnected to getting emails and emailing people. And sometimes things get lost in the shuffle because you got so much clutter. One thing with a spam phone call, it's pretty easy. Like, yeah, I don't need to pick this up. Or if this is not spam and it's important, they can leave me a voicemail that I'll probably never listen to. But uh, if they do, then I can figure out who it is and, and call them back if necessary. But I'm with you. The, the the spam email situation. I wonder the percentage of business that is generated from spam emails, right? That actually a lead from a spam email turns into something. Now, sometimes it gets you, right? It's like, God, I thought I unsubscribed from Travis Matthews. And then you'll get one, you're like 50% sale off all collared shirts and hats. Like, oh shit, I'll buy some. <laughs> Fugazi Friday. Since you're a golfer, when I pay $30 for a cart and my girlfriend is with me, the cart costs $60. Nice guy of you to bring her on a little golf trip. She's not playing. But if I'm by myself, it costs $30. 
So really, it's $30 a seat on the golf cart. $60 for a cart is crazy. And I'm at a private club. We usually walk, but the concept is still there. I was going to defend the cart, Fugazi, because I was at TPC the other day, and I finished. I, I played early in the morning. I teed off at like 7.10, so I was done by 11.30. It was so bad. I was like, I'm going to go hit some golf balls. And I'm not, I'm not trying to act like I'm Tiger Woods or anything like I'm some grinder. But it was, I was like, I don't even know what I'm doing. So I'm going to go to the range. Well, I got up to where the cart barn is. And I said, hey, and usually you just take a cart to go down there. I'm like, hey, can I take a cart? I usually just hop in. We don't even ask. But I, there was only a couple carts there. And I asked my guy, Casey, I'm like, can I just grab one of these? He's like, actually, we're out of carts. He's like, some days, you know, on super busy days, and a lot of the pros that come there practice, they all grab their own cart. Even sometimes they come together. He's like, we just don't have any. So some of it is just based on inventory at these public courses. Like they, they just don't have enough golf carts for how many people are playing. The private course thing, that's pretty absurd. Uh, that's crazy. Now, it, it, if they were charging you for your own cart and you can't bring them, it's one thing a lot of these private courses charge you a fee to just drive your own cart. Like my brother who lives on a golf course, has his own cart, can drive up and plays on his own cart, but he still pays, I think like hundred dollars a quarter or $200 a quarter. Again, it's, they're running a business too, but getting charged per person in your cart at a private course. I agree. That's a little outrageous. Oh, this is a tipping one. I'll try to avoid John. I live in a state run by liberals. In addition to a recent ban on plastic bags, Fugazi, we also have a ban on flavored tobacco. Tobacco. It was presented under the Fugazi of preventing the sale of methyl cigarettes to minors. To minors. Yet they also ban flavored Zin pouches. Clearly Zin is not tobacco. No, it's not. It's nicotine. They sell flavored Nicorette gum. What's next? Flavored liquor? I know uh, I was playing golf with a guy the other day, and I offered him a Zin on, like, the second hole. And he's like, don't worry about it. I got my own. And then we started talking as the round went on. This guy lives in Southern California. And, so and California has banned flavored Zins. Now, and like you said, their idea, again, like, a lot of these states that ban stuff, they overregulate everything. Is against, you know, miners having the ability to buy them. So this guy said he was going to buy like several logs of the flavor he likes to take it back. I didn't realize flavored Zins will, were banned until I'll, my brother and I were talking. He's like, yeah, I don't have the ability to get the coffee Zins here. Uh, I'm with you. That's some of these ideas. This is why, like, I don't even know. It's just, it's beyond stupid. The nitpicking on things that make absolutely no sense. I'd like to see the data too. Like how many youth is trying to buy the flavored Zins? Also, isn't the Zin nicotine has a lot of positives for you? Like the one thing with tobacco I get, right? The cancerous, the, the fiberglass, it's not good for you chewing tobacco. Now I never chewed because it just didn't, like a lot of my friends did growing up. A lot of my friends still do. It never worked in my body. Like I, it just kind of made me sick. Uh, even for as much as I want to do, like in high school to be cool or whatever, I, I could never do it. Couldn't stomach it. The Zins are incredible. I mean, I, I've been going through like a tin a day. They're not really a tin. They're plastic, but you know what I mean? California, man. You never know what they're going to ban and allow. And they're usually on the opposite ends of the spectrum of like, this makes no sense and neither does this. That's why your boys in Arizona. For Fugazi Friday. I go to a gym where at one point I used to grab a protein shake after every workout. Those protein shakes were $5 and have jumped to $8. I love these shakes, but not as much as a Starbucks coffee. Here's a reality. My, my gym, I guess the last two gyms I've worked at have had a cafeteria. The one I had in the Bay Area and now the one I have here in Scottsdale. And both of them had sweet protein shakes. I mean, it just fucking melt in your mouth. There's always a huge markup on those. There really is. It makes no sense 
if you're a protein shake guy, now I understand sometimes if you're working out in the morning and then going to the office, it's not like you can go home. If you are coming home after the workout, the amount of money, it's no different than buying coffee and not going to Starbucks. The bang for your buck is a dramatic gap between the two. So yeah, sometimes you go to Starbucks, one, it's convenient. Two, sometimes you just don't want to make coffee. But we all know at this point in time, the difference in the cost. I did the other day, I got a, they have this mocha java smoothie that is like mocha java. I, I get peanut butter in there and has protein. It's it's excellent. It's elite. It's also $10. So I know every time I buy it, it's stupid that I bought it. But yesterday I really wanted one. And I also told them to throw in a shot of espresso. The smoothie was $14. So I complain about it. But I'm not going to because I, I've acknowledged like the first time it's like, like you said, sometimes things jump. But hey, we live in like historically inflationary times. Like, what about the month, the month data? No, over the last three years, I saw something the other day that a lot of goods and services have generated a jump between 20 to 25 percent. And I was listening to a finance podcast that talked about like typically everything constantly goes up over a period of time. You know, the, the jump we've had historically would have been over like a seven to nine year period. It happened in like 24 months. It's jolting. But it, even if things are expensive at the store, it's still cheaper to do it, whether it's coffee instead of Starbucks, whether it's a protein shake instead of your gym. It's always going to be that way. It always is. Now, there's a convenience factor. Like sometimes like, I don't really want to do the dishes. But that's lazy. That's me being lazy. Fugazi Friday for you. People who ride the elevator for one floor, unless you have a physical limitation, heavy baggage, like groceries and luggage, or kids to pack, take the stairs. <laughs> the elevator should be packed with people who are going up, should not be packed with people going up one story. I agree. I don't, I don't have anything to add there. Bugazi Friday. For the first time this year, now... What's stair situation? That's always a question. Are there stairs? Are they easily accessible? For the first time this year, I tried watching the NBA. I turned on YouTube TV to watch the Lakers Bucks game. I watched that the other night. LeBron just conveniently not playing. Lakers won anyway. And it was blacked out in my area. I try HBO next and same thing. The NBA is a joke and doesn't even let people watch if they want to watch. Reason why the NFL is king. I've never had a blackout problem uh, on my YouTube TV, any game. So I, I don't quite know what's going on there. I can't speak to it. I, I don't know if it's an NBA thing or more of a coverage thing. Sometimes the games are blacked out. Yeah, I don't know where you live. If you live in Milwaukee or LA, it's on the local broadcast, maybe, or vice versa. But... To me, the blackout thing in general is like, I get we got contracts, I get we got rules, but in 2024, under no circumstance should any game ever be blacked out. Let the consumer consume. We got too many options. There's a million things to watch. If you give anyone a reason to like, oh, this is too big of a headache changing the channel, you've lost. And the loyalty, and listen, the loyalty in my generation as a consumer has never been shorter, ever. So you just, you got to figure that out. I, I can't speak to your exact problem, but uh, happy Fugazi Friday.